Suddenly, I heard a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Devil's night is upon us again. So we throw a little party, start a bunch of fires. The fuck you all painted up for, crackhead, huh? I got a goddamn vigilante killer knocking off scumbags left and right. I got trouble. One of my crew got himself perished. They got that motor too, too. Do you remember Shelley Webster? Webster's dead, my friend. This ghost gonna kill my ass next. This ghost gonna kill me. Hey. his link between the land of the living and the realm of the dead. Hold still. Come back. Don't kill me. I'm not going to kill you. Your job will be to tell the rest of them death is coming for them tonight. Tell them Eric Draven sends his regards. <laughs> In 1994, The Crow came to the big screen, directed by Alex Proyas, and based on the 1989 comic strip written by James O. Barr. The original story revolves around an unfortunate young man named Eric. He and his fiancée Shelley are assaulted by a gang of street thugs after their car breaks down. Eric is shot in the head and is paralysed, and can only watch as Shelley is savagely beaten and raped. They are then left for dead on the side of the road. He is resurrected by a crow and seeks revenge on the murderers. Produced on a budget of $15 million and made nearly $150 million worldwide, one of the biggest selling points of the movie was Brandon Lee, the son of the legendary martial artist Bruce Lee. Brandon Lee was unfortunately shot and killed by accident on set. There was a lot of controversy surrounding his death and some claiming it was a curse because he died so young, just like his dad. The scene in which Lee was accidentally shot Lee's character walks into his apartment and discovers his fiance being beaten and raped by the thugs. The character Funboy fires a 44 Magnum and revolver at Lee as he walks into the room. At some point during the filming, the revolver was apparently discharged with one of those improperly deactivated cartridges into the chamber, setting off the primer with enough force to drive the bullet part way into the barrel, where it became stuck. The prop crew either failed to notice or failed to recognize the significance of this issue. In the fatal scene which called for the revolver to be actually fired at Lee from a distance of 12 to 15 feet, the dummy cartridges were exchanged with blank rounds, which featured a live powder charge of primer but no bullet, thus allowing the gun to be fired without the risk of an actual projectile. As the production company had sent the firearm specialist home early, responsibility for the guns were given to a prop assistant, who was not aware of the rule for checking all firearms before and after any handling. Therefore, the barrel was not checked for obstructions when it came time to load it with the blank rounds. Since the bullet from the dummy round was already trapped in the barrel, this caused a 44 Magnum bullet to be fired out of the barrel with virtually the same force as if the gun had been loaded with a live round, and it struck Lee in the chest, mortally wounding him. He was rushed to hospital where he underwent six hours of surgery. However, attempts to save him were unsuccessful, and Lee was pronounced dead at the age of 28. The shooting was ruled an accident. Paramount Studios, who were originally going to distribute The Crow theatrically, although some reports had mentioned it being a direct-to-video feature, the studio opted out of involvement due to delays in filming and some controversy over the violent content being inappropriate given Lee's death. However, Miramax picked it up with the intention of releasing it in theatres and pumped a further $8 million as well as the insurance company to complete the production taking its budget to approximately $23 million. The cast and crew then took a break for script rewrites of the flashback scenes that had yet to be completed. 
From what I gathered, the scene in which Eric Draven returns to his home and has flashbacks is one of the scenes that was reshot without Brandon, because you don't see the actor's face, and when you see the reflections in the mirror, it appears to be shots of Brandon added digitally. There are probably some other shots with a double just to complete reshoots, but in all, they did a really good job of finishing the film. Down to the movie's success, they did produce a sequel titled City of Angels, but it was heavily panned on release and made far less at the box office, and the following sequels were released straight to video. There is a remake in the works, a couple of actors were attached, such as Tom Hiddleston and Bradley Cooper. There are even designs produced with Bradley in mind, but the producers in May of this year settled on Luke Evans to play the lead role. Apparently the remake is going to stay as faithful to the original as possible, and creator James O'Barr is attached as the film's creative consultant. If they claim they are going to stay faithful to the original, it sort of defeats the idea of doing a remake. The story for the 1994 movie does differ from the comics, especially in regards to Eric and Shelley's death. On the 30th of October, during the annual Devil's Night crime spree in the city of Detroit, Michigan, the local police sergeant, played by Ernie Hudson, is at the scene of a crime where Shelley Webster has been beaten and violated, and her fiancé, guitarist Eric Draven, has been killed. The couple were to be married the next day on Halloween. As he leaves for the hospital with Shelley, the sergeant meets a young girl, Sarah, whom Shelley and Eric cared for. Her mother, however, Darla, is a drug addict, who works as a waitress for one of the criminals who killed Eric and Shelley. The sergeant lies to Sarah, telling her everything will be okay, and that Shelley will be fine. A year later, after the tragic events, Sarah visits Eric and Shelley's graves and leaves flowers. As she leaves the cemetery, a crow swoops down and lands on Eric's headstone and taps it. Later that night, Eric awakens from death and climbs frantically out of his grave. Eric follows the crow through the streets of Detroit and finds some boots and a dumpster for him to wear. The crow helps him remember his past by leading Eric to his old apartment and finds it in ruins. He is met by his cat, Gabriel, who is still alive and remembers his old master. He experiences flashbacks of his own death, remembering that he and Shelley were murdered by local thugs, T-Bird, Tintin, Funboy and Skank, who work for a notorious gang boss named Top Dollar. Eric swings out the window he was thrown out of, piercing his hands on the remaining shards of glass. He sees his wounds regenerate and close, discovering that any wounds he suffers heal immediately, and that he, being dead, is now immune to physical harm. He then replaces his burial clothes with a dark, imposing costume, and paints his face in a parody of a porcelain harlequin mask. Guided by the crow, he sets out to avenge his and Shelley's deaths. Eric finds out that he can see what the crow sees telepathically. The crow helps Eric locate Tintin, and they engage on a one-on-one -on -one street fight, after which Eric kills Tintin with his own knives. He then goes to Gideon's pawn shop, where Tintin pawned Shelley's engagement ring the year before. Eric forces his way into the shop and demands to see a particular gold ring. Gideon shoots Eric in the chest with his revolver, and he is shocked and frightened when the wound heals. Eric then forces Gideon to return the ring and interrogates him about Tintin's associates. Gideon tells him that they hang out at a bar called The Pit, and that Funboy lives upstairs. Gideon pleads for his life, and Eric lets him live to deliver a warning to the rest of the gang. The soundtrack album was very popular on release, and the producer of the film, Jeff Most, and said it sold over 4 million copies. It features covers including Trent Reznor, who covered Joy Division's Dead Souls, Pantera, who covered Poison Ideas, The Badge, and Rollins Band, who covered Suicide's Ghost Rider. Rage Against Machine re-recorded their 1991 B-side Darkness of Greed, and renamed it Darkness for this soundtrack. The Cure also rewrote their song Burn for the movie. One of my personal favourite moments, which I don't think is part of the album, is the short scene with the character Eric Draven playing his guitar on top of a roof. Great guitar solo and amazing visuals. The score was composed by Graham Ravel, who has provided many scores to classic movies from the 90s, and provided his talents on the Riddick trilogy. The score is definitely one of the standout moments of the film to me. It really drives the emotional scenes, and obviously knowing Brandon died on set, it gives the emotional core of the film that much more weight, and it can be upsetting for some people, especially near the end, where he visits Shelley's grave. It's one of those soundtracks I often listen to, and I highly recommend it. When I was a kid, it was certainly a movie I wanted to watch because it was Brandon Lee's last film. I had previously seen Rapid Fire and Showdown in Little Tokyo, so I was already a fan, but with it being an 18 rated film, it was difficult to get to view it at my age. I had to rely on my dad to rent it for me. Over the years, when I watch it again, I always forget that it was made in 1994, 
next year the Crow is 20 years old and it certainly has aged extremely well in many areas. Thanks to its visual design, it looked ahead of its time and it was praised heavily by many who saw it on release. There were comparisons made to Tim Burton's Batman and yeah there is some similarities but the world in which Eric Draven lives is far more threatening and dangerous. It has stronger elements of gothic architecture and film noir. It's a huge shame what happened to Brandon and this movie really showed that he was very talented and had a lot to offer. His death obviously played a part in the movie's success. People went out of their way to see his last film, but the movie has many strong elements that make it successful without having that advertised fact that it was Brandon's last feature. If he hadn't died the movie would have been successful anyway, but possibly not made as much money at the box office. It's difficult to predict, but he would have gone on anyway to greater things, but to many fans of his it would have been so cool to have him play as Neo in the Matrix trilogy. The ultimate fanboy dream. When you watch Brandon Lee's films, you sometimes think he doesn't look like his father, but then again there are moments where he acts just like his dad. The same mannerisms and the way he moves, it creates a great connection that you can see his father in him. And Brandon had the huge weight and responsibility of living up to his dad's legacy. They both had so much to give in life, and it's just upsetting that both their lives were cut short. For me, The Crow isn't that rewatchable. I watch it maybe once a year, and I think because of its themes, and it is very downbeat, the whole movie has a very sad story and deals with revenge. The movie ends positively, but I think you need to be in the right frame of mind to feel encouraged to view it on a regular basis. You could essentially ignore its dark themes and just watch it frequently because of its amazing visuals, which I can fully understand. The plot is not original, it is a simple revenge story, which is fine because it introduces the new idea of a hero and the crow being his link to return from the afterlife. I always felt the movie moved along at a quick pace and I wanted more of Eric being with his girlfriend or seeing him with his band. You're told his backstory in flashbacks, it works within the context of the story, but I always wanted more. The movie is just over 90 minutes and there isn't much left on the cutting room floor. From what I've seen, the screenwriter in DVD commentary did reveal a lot was cut from the first rough cut. The DVD has deleted scenes which after viewing them just mostly consist of B-roll footage. The expanded scenes do add a little more and the first scene in which he escapes from the grave and encounters the lady from the arcade I think should have been left in because it introduces his first ability of being able to read people's minds. And also you see him kill off the character Funboy, which in the movie it just cuts to him being stabbed with loads of needles and also should have been left in due to the fact that you see Eric kill all the other gang members who originally killed him and Shelley. With the character Eric being a musician, it helped with the gothic romance of the movie and the rock and roll energy it has to the visuals and action scenes. The image of the crow has certainly become a part of pop culture. There are loads of statues and figures based on the character and the makeup design has become popular with many lads at Halloween. Maybe a bit too popular. It's a costume party, so you have to wear a costume, but nobody better show up as the crow. I'm serious. Every costume party, there's like 14 guys who come dressed like the crow because they want to look hot and hook up. It's lame. The cast fit perfectly well within the film, but my personal favourites are Ernie Hudson. He is reliable as ever on screen. Michael Wincott as Top Dollar is a great villain and has a strong threatening presence. I love his voice, it's very commanding, but it does sound like he's been smoking 50 Marlboro Reds a day. Many will recognise David Patrick Kelly as T-Bird. He has appeared in many classic movies such as The Warriors and Commando. Skank played by Angel David is probably the funniest out of the bunch of bad guys. He is basically a speed freak and talks at 100 miles per hour. I have many favourite scenes from The Crow, particularly when he visits the pawn shop and threatens the owner. The shootout scene at Top Dollar's base of operations and pretty much all the moments he has with the little girl Sarah help make the character of Eric more than just a cliched action hero. There are many fans of The Crow and rightly so. It works on many levels and showed the world that Brandon Lee was a great actor and was taken from us too soon. It also demonstrated Alex Poyas as an incredible visualist and he went on to make one of the most beautiful looking films of the 90s, Dark City. If you've never seen The Crow before, I hope you seek it out as soon as possible if you are already a fan and own the film, I hope I've encouraged you to grab it out of your collection and watch it again. Mother 
is the name for God on the lips and hearts of all children? Do you understand? Morphine is bad for you. Stolen from us. Way to have them live on and never stop loving them.